Hey, hello again. Welcome to my channel. I made this video. If you're a student in school and you're learning about history or you're just interested about history, but maybe not to advance. Yes, and then this channel is for you. Every week, I'm going to make a new content about history. So subscribe and stay tuned. And today we will talk about Constantine and Edict of Milan. But first, I have to give you guys the background story. Emperor Diocletian, he split the Roman Empire into two, between East and West. It's just because somehow the Roman Empire fell into the civil war. As a solution that he offered is to split the Roman Empire in half and he appointed himself as the Augustus and Maximian as his Caesar. Now, Roman Empire in the 4th century had a series of a civil war. Emperor Diocletian, he solved this problem with the civil war by splitting the empire into two, into half, between the east and west. He appointed himself as Augustus and he appointed his assistant Maximian as his Caesar. Augustus and Caesar. And not just that one. He later on appointing two junior emperor, junior emperor, someone by the name of like Constantius and Galerius. So with this four guys with these four people like you know ruling the roman empire into four we know it as a tetrarchy okay or the rule of four diocletian made a great idea he restored the roman empire into orderliness however the main problem of the roman empire is always the emperor succession or the passing down who is going to become the next emperor even though Diocletian Tetrarchy sounds a good idea, but not impractical. Now, according to the plan, Diocletian and Maximian, his assistant, is going to resign, retire, and then he they will be replaced by their junior emperors, which is like Galerius and Constantius. Now, here comes the problem. And this problem start with junior emperor himself by the name of Galerius. He was not satisfied to become just like Augustus. He decided to become like the one and only sole ruler for the Roman Emperor. So he convinced Diocletian and Maximian to step down and then like to appoint him to become like the, the main emperor. Later, Galerius, he picked another two junior emperor, someone by the name of Severus and Maximinus. But what about Constantius? Isn't it Constantius is the also the emperor of the western side of the Roman emperor Empire right now? Yes, he is. In fact, he is still become like the emperor at the time in the west. The trouble starts when Constantius died. He died and then he was being replaced by his son, someone by the name of Constantine. According to Galerius' plan, the <laughs> troops, the followers of Constantius should pledge their loyalty to Severus, which is the emperor of the western Roman Empire after Constantius died. His loyal followers did not agree with the idea of Galerius. Things become heat up when Maximinus decided to become also the emperor of the Western Roman Empire, which is at that time the emperor for the Western Roman Empire supposed to be Severus. Now, the goal of Galerius did not, did not work, did not work at all. So, Maximinus, he conquered the city of Rome, Severus, he, he surrendered, and then he committed suicide. So now we got Galerius as the emperor in the east and then like Maximinus as the emperor in the west. What about Constantius? Yes, Constantius, he died. And then his followers, his soldiers, his loyal troops, rather than following Galerius or rather than following, they're pledging their loyalty to Maximinus, they decided to follow the son of Constantius by the name of Constantine. Yes. So... Therefore, we have three fractions right now. Galerius, Maximinus, and Constantine, the son of Constantius. Apparently, the Roman Empire fell into another civil war! Yes, this is like a headache for Galerius. So Galerius decided to consult with the senior emperor by the name of Diocletian. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Galerius is the one who kind of like convinced Diocletian to resign and then somehow appointing himself to become the emperor. And 
he thought that he's a smart cookie by kind of like you know appointing another uh, tetrarchy, another kind of like you know assistant to help him, Zever Severus and also Maximinus, but it didn't work. So as he consulted with Diocletian, and then he convinced Diocletian to kind of like you know return as the kind of like the emperor. Come on, quit your retirement. Come back, you and Maximian. Please return to become like a, become the emperor of the Roman Empire, and like you know, help me solve the problem. And guess what? Diocletian refused because he was at this moment he was an old man, and he had a peaceful life. He would rather to live as a turnip farmer. Yes, as a turnip farmer, rather than like going back to as an emperor. That's Diocletian. But however, Diocletian give a advice. And he proposed an idea to appoint another Caesar or appoint another junior emperor in the East, someone by the name of Licinius. Oh my goodness, this is so complicated. Now we got Galerius, we got Maximinus, we got Constantine, the son of Constantius, and we got Licinius. So there are four fractions here in the Roman Empire. This is the perfect moment to have another civil war. So now I am going to talk about Constantine. Constantine, he's the son of Constantius, and Constantine's mother is a Christian. While Constantius, he's not. He's a Roman pagan. And then, like, but meanwhile, like, you know, Helena. Her name is Helena. Constantine grew up with the kind of like idea about like you know what is Christianity all about. Like you know, pray before you meet, pray before you eat your meal, pray before you go to bed, and then so on and so on, and read your Bible. He spent most of his time. Being taken as a hostage by Diocletian and later on by Galeria somehow, it was just like the custom during those times is to make sure that Constantius will not going to rebel against him. So that was the system that they kind of like invent, taking as a hostage to make sure the loyalty of your subject or the loyalty of your followers. Now, Constantine and his followers and his soldiers by this moment. They decided to conquer western side of the room, which is at that time the emperor is someone by the name of Maximinus. And then there is this kind of like you know important event in history. We know it as the Battle of Milvian Bridge. In the attempt to overtake Rome from Maximinus, Constantine realized that he was outnumbered. He's badly outnumbered. Now one day. I mean, one night before the battle, he was terrified. He was afraid. He was thinking like, "Oh no, this is it. This is will be the end of me and my attempt to overtake Rome." But one day, he then saw the sign in the sky, a bright cross, a bright shining cross, and then it has a writing. It has a writing. In this sign, you shall victory. In this sign, you shall win. In hoc signo vinces. Finkes, I'm sorry, my Latin is ho so horrible. It gave Constantine a confidence, continue his attempt to overtake the city of Rome. Later on, he ordered his men, he, he ordered his soldiers to draw some kind of a, a new symbol in their in their in their shield. It looks like kind of like superimposed letter P and letter X. It's a Greek alphabet, which is G and Rho, which is that is the initial of Christ. Now, the next morning, the battle broke, and then if only Maximinus decided to kind of like you know fight against the Constantine army behind the wall, from within the safety of the Roman city wall, then probably the story will be different. Unfortunately, Maximinus he listened to the wrong kind of like you know advice. He listened to oracle. He decided to meet up in a battle. Now, it is a big no-no to fight with your enemy on the bridge. It's a big no-no. Now, in this battle, Maximinus he fell from the bridge, and then he fell into the river, and then he drowned. Such a tragic end of Maximinus. With the death of Maximinus, now no one can stop Constantine. Now, Constantine right now he become the Ruler, he become the emperor of the Western Roman Empire. What about Galerius? Well, by this time Galerius he died. Let's talk about Galerius a little bit, shall we? If Diocletian is kind of like sounds kind of like bit harsh towards the Christian, originally he was not. 
he was being harsh towards the Christian because he was being kind of like badly advised by Galerius who do not like the Christians. In fact, the persecution towards the towards the church that happened to die to during the Diocletian's era or Diocletian's reign, it was because of like you know his suspicion that his palace, Diocletian's palace, was burned to- twice, and then Galerius spread the gossip, make a rumors that it was the Christian the one who started the fire. And now for the Galerius, he was like utterly mean towards the Christian. He systematically, globally persecute the Christians. The Christians were being tortured, the Christians were being arrested, their property, their houses will be confiscated, and um, they were being forced either to deny their faith or just kind of like, you know, died because of the torture. Galerius' practice of persecuting the Christian, confiscating the land belongs to the Christian, were being followed by his successor, which is Licinius. However, Galerius' attitude towards the Christian, towards the church, turning like 180 degrees just few days before he died. Apparently, even though Galerius, he do not like the Christian, but it seems to be, he believes the Christians. He is afraid with the Christian God. He do not want to anger the Christian God. So what he did was, he changed the rules. He make a new rules that uh, the Christian must not be persecuted anymore in the east. Oh yeah, Galerius, he is the emperor in the east. He decided to stop the persecution in the east just for the sake that somehow the Christian God will not going to punish him. Now at this moment, by the way, Galerius, he was very, very sick. He was very ill and then it was a very painful moment for him. And he thought that the affliction that he received, the, the sickness that he got is because that he was being mean to the Christians. Apparently, several days later, he died. And the persecutions toward the Christian in the East was kind of like halt at that time, but only for a while. Because later on, Licinius, remember about Licinius? He became the emperor, replacing Galerius. He became like the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire. He continued the practice of like persecution. What about Constantine? As he became like the emperor of the Western Roman Empire, did he continue the systematic persecutions toward the Christian? He did not. Remember I told you before, Constantine's mother is a Christian. So I'm pretty sure her teaching really influenced his mind. Now, Constantine, he decided to stop the persecutions of the Christian, at least in the West. He, together, he inviting Licinius, which is like the new emperor in the East. They sit, they meet up in Milan, and then they make an agreement. They make a decree. And from that moment on, the Christian will no longer be persecuted. They, if they were being kept in a prison, they will be released. If their land, if their house is being confiscated, and it will be returned to them. And they make a new rules that no Christian buildings, no Christian church, no Christian can be harmed. Now, it was a big thing for, for the church history. Before, the Christian, they, they endure a long period of like being persecuted under the Roman emperors. It's on and off though, it's on and off, not every time. Now, it's a turning point. Now, the Christian, they can practice their faith without fear of being arrested by the Roman authority. Think about that. This is a turning point in the history. Now, this decree known as the Edict of Milan. Edict of Milan in 313 AD. Even though it sounds like a good news for the Christian during those time, over the years, it has a consequences though. The church, they start to having a lot of like, you know, new converts to Christianity. However, these converts, they become a Christian not just because they truly believe in Christ. They become Christians because they realize that it's so much easier for them to convert to, convert to Christianity because the Emperor Constantine giving extra favor towards the Christians. So think about that. People become Christian because somehow it seems the, uh, their life will become so much easier. So that is not a good motivation for people who like to convert to Christianity. And it will create a lot of problems in the church. It create uh, several heresies and false teaching. 
and it creates superstitions and it create the corruption within the church organization itself. Some of the Christian they decided to leave the city and then they move into the desert, into isolated places and live as a hermit. It was through crisis that the Christian faith grow because somehow during the crisis time the Christian, the brother and sisters in Christ, they're helping one another sincerely. They willing to lay down their life to help their friends, to help their brother and sisters in Christ. It was the true mark of the Christian faith. It was the true mark of the Christian love and sacrifice. And then it attracts a lot of people. It attracts a lot of people to the Christian faith from the first until the fifth century. One of my favorite story about the true mark of the Christianity is the story about 40 Roman legions of Sebastic. The story goes like this. Remember about Licinius, the Eastern Roman Emperor that replacing Galerius? Yes, he was practicing persecutions toward the Christian. The Christians in the East, they persecuted the most compared to the West. One of them is these 40 soldiers. Now, the soldiers, they pledge their loyalty, of course, to the Roman. For the glory of Rome, for the honor of Rome. It came the time that Licinius make a decree that every element of the Christianity must be removed from the Roman military. Including this legion by the name of the 12th Roman Legion, known as the, the Armed with Lightning. These are like the navy seals of the Roman Empire during those time. Now, there was this 40 Roman soldiers, they proclaimed themselves as a Christian. The Roman commander of the 12th legion tried to clear off his ranks from any kind of like Christians because Christians considered to be as a potential threat, as a potential traitor for them. So he found out 40 of his men are Christians. Of course, first the commander asked them to deny their faith and pledge their loyalty to the Roman gods by offering sacrifice to the Roman gods. Of course, these 40 Christian soldiers refused. Now because of that one, they got themselves into a trouble. They were being prisoned with the hope that they will change their mind. No, they didn't. And later on, they were being tortured with the, the commander hope that these 40 soldiers will change their mind to following Christ. No, they did not. And finally, ultimately, the commander decided the harshest way. They were being stripped naked and they have to walk in the middle of the lake, a frozen lake. Now, this is during the winter time. They were being forced to walk in the middle of the lake and stay there, stay there overnight to be exposed with the cold element, with the cold wind and also like the low temperature with the hope that they will somehow change their mind to deny Christ. To make things worse, they're the commander prepared a hot bath by the edge of the lake. So anyone deny Christ their faith, they can take the hot bath. Now as these 40 soldiers, they are encouraging one another, the fellow brothers in Christ. They were praying and then they, they sing worship song. They encouraging each other. They keep singing to keep themselves warm. And they pray to God, Oh God, kept us, uh, kept our number. So our number still 40 and strong. So we may die for your kingdom, for your name. And they keep singing and they keep singing until like, you know, one of them, one of them decided had enough. He walked away from the rest of the 39 and he walked towards the hot bath that is already being prepared. Seems to be he about to deny Christ. As yes, of course, he denied Christ. He took the warm bath. The moment that he entered into this kind of like, you know, the hot bath, he died instantly because of the extreme condition. One of the guard saw it happens and he removed his uniform, he removed his helmet, he leave his post and like joining the rest of the 39 and he replacing the the 40th man who just died. He joined the rank and then he kind of like you know he link up his arm that soldier become believer of Christ. So the number remains 40. And then in the next morning, of course, all of them 
they died because of like, exposed to the element. And their body was being burned. Their ashes of their body will be, and then later on, thrown away into the nearby river. They were known as the 40 saints of Sebasti. Interesting, isn't it? So, there you go. That is the end of the lecture. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.